I'm going to begin a study that I know will go beyond this afternoon's period of Bible study in this sermon. I want to deal or begin dealing with evolution as a threat to the Christian home. It's a threat to far more than that, but it's a threat to the Christian home. Now, we have, these were produced in 2009 for the lectureship in England called the Darwin Delusion. John has a, John West has a chapter in it. I have a couple of chapters in it, wrote forward. Several others do on dealing with this because we published it that year in England because that was the 200th anniversary of the birthday of Charles Darwin. If I remember right, because Keith Sisman was alive still at that time, he was able to put this in several libraries throughout England as well as to give it to members of parliament in England. What all have been done with it, who knows. But nevertheless, we have some copies. If you think that will benefit you and if you promise before God that you're going to take it and use it right and study it with your Bible open, then it's here for your asking. Many, many years ago, and I don't know how long ago it was, there was the president of the American Atheistic Society. I believe it was called Annual Association of the Advancement of Atheism. It was actually published back in 1928. And here's what's written in it. I'm quoting. In the beginning was matter, which begat the amoeba, which begat the worm, which begat the fish, which begat the amphibian, which begat the reptile, which begat the lower mammal, which begat the lemur, which begat the monkey, which begat man, who imagined God. This is the genealogy of man, unquote. Charles Smith, who was a president of the American Association for the Advancement of Atheism, had a little pamphlet in which he published that in it. Now, some of our brethren debated him back in those days. That's a long time ago now. But this shows you where you are if you're going to say that evolution is the way we got here. Now, it's interesting to note that Darwin and others with him just simply started with things that were here already and said, here's how they developed. You have that kind of presentation from a man that says God does not exist. Of course, he can look at everything around him and say, well, it's here, so I have to try to figure out how it got here because God certainly didn't do it. And yet, 3,500 years before this man penned what I just read to you. Moses wrote this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Genesis 1.1. I asked you, in fact, some time ago, back, I guess, in the spring or early summer. It, well, it would have been around the 4th of July. At the snow cone stand, there was a young fella. He and his fiancée, or whatever she was, they were there, and he was very friendly and talkative. 
He indicated he had no religious background. What little bit of church he had been exposed to came from his grandparents. Very friendly fellow. He wasn't sure about anything to do with religion, but especially about God. Well, we stand there in the parking lot. And I said, will you look around yourself here? Just look around. I want you to pick out something right here that does not evidence design and if a designer, a designer, and the power to bring it about. Find it for me. Well, of course he couldn't. I invite anybody here to try that. There never has been a design without somebody to design it. Never has been. And that some person had to be somebody with power to do it. I've mentioned this before, but however many years ago that was, Ken and Nancy, when we were in England together, we went into the uh, museum. And one wing of it has all of this stuff that came from King George III, who was quite a Renaissance man before he went crazy. And here was actually a model in bronze of the solar system, quite a large thing. And I thought, well, what is that evidence? It evidences a design. There had to be some person capable of putting that thing together because it had the sun in the middle and all the planets circling it. Everything was in bronze. It was quite a large thing. Now, what would you think of a person supposedly with common sense, a little bit of education, who walked up that and said, that just happened? It doesn't evidence design. It evidences that it came from confusion. You wouldn't believe that. You look at one of these beautiful live oak trees out front. Does it evidence design? As I say again, I invite anyone anywhere to look around in nature and see if you don't see design. And if there's a design, there's a designer capable of bringing that design into reality. Now, somebody may say, well, yeah, but look at all these mutations and look at this, that, and the other, and where did cancer come from and all that. Well, I have no problem answering that. It's because of sin. When sin entered the world, the breaking of God's law, man separated from God. It affected more than just the spiritual separation from God and physical death coming about. It impacted the whole world. I don't know what the world was like before the flood, but I do know why the flood came. It was to destroy wicked people who chose not to retain God in their knowledge and decided to do as they did and were living as ungodly as you possibly could. And when that flood came, it changed the whole topography of the world. It changed from the way it worked before the flood. And if you can see that various strains of sheep or cattle have been deliberately designed by a geneticist, then if you see people getting further away from the fruit of the tree of life because they were cut off from it because of sin, you can see then where all sorts of things happen that bring about all kinds of problems, starting from the deoxyribose nucleic acid DNA that changes everything outwardly. And they know now very well that a lot of the problems we face is sickness, that is, is genetic. Now, they don't quite know what to do because they're afraid if they go in there, even though there is some 
technology where they could do some of this and change some of those genes in changing one. Uh, we may change something we didn't intend to change, and who knows what will come of that. So that's why you have the consequences of sin in the world as far as death is concerned, as far as cancer is concerned, as far as murder is concerned. So we need to recognize that part of it. And if you don't want God, then you might as well go back to what Smith said in the beginning was matter. But nobody can prove that. Scientists can't do it. They can't do it at all. Some years ago, and it's been quite a while ago now, they had a forum up at Lone Star in which they had, I don't remember now, I don't think anybody's here that went to that, but some of us did at that time, which they had uh, atheists and dealing with creation and people who were theists dealing with creation and all of that stuff. And I was quite pleased to see, though he did not believe that God created the heavens and the earth, but he made a comment that everybody should have thought about. As a scientist, he was at the University of Houston. He said, really, this whole subject of discussion is not in the realm of science. It's in the realm of philosophy or religion. But everybody seemed to hear him say that, but the implications of it missed them a mile. What is he saying? Why would he say it's not in the realm of science? It's because of the scientific method that every scientist worth his salt <laughs> employs, no matter what. And that means a scientist knows that you can't be a scientist without being able to use your five senses to examine something. And there's no way anybody's going to be able to examine the beginning of all things. It's outside the purview of science. It's in the area of philosophy or religion, and I could say and or religion. Because once you start reasoning from what's obvious before us, as I said, design implies a what? A designer. A designer capable of designing this live oak tree out there. And it really comes down to quite simple. I've heard this all my life. Old farmers can use this and have. If I walk out into my field and I'm walking the fence and I see a turtle sitting on top of the fence post, I know that turtle did not get there by himself. I didn't see who put him there. How many may have been involved in putting him there. But somebody put him on that fence post, and I may never know, but I know one thing. He didn't do it by himself, and somebody did. And I know that. K-N-O-W. I know that. Did you see him do it? No. Did you smell the person that did it? Did you hear the person that did it? Did you see the person that did it? Did you touch the person that did it? He's on top of that fence post. How'd he get there? Somebody put the thing there. Now, when you begin to deal with a great many highly learned people, they've learned that they can't tell why that turtle's on top of the fence post. They can even go against the very common sense they were born with. And so it is when it comes to either divine mind is eternal and did not have a beginning, the first cause is uncaused. Or matter, lifeless matter is eternal. Now that's what it reduces down to. There's no other choice. Well, how is there any scientific evidence That dead matters, Brother Warren said in his debate with flu, dead rocks and dirt got busy and created life. 
Where is there anything in science that says life comes from that? Not there. Thus, we have to depend upon our powers of reason and the evidence out there before us. And if you don't want to believe that some human being put that turtle up the fence post, just go ahead and not believe it. I'm going to believe the evidence that implies a person did, though I may never know that person. It's that simple. Why do you think that we need all this other stuff to confuse us? But I read this from Smith. Matter beget the amoeba, beget the worm, beget the fish, beget the amphibian, and so on. Then we got the man. He imagined God. Well, think about that for a minute. Why should somebody, a human being, who we must admit have power of intellect and rationality, why should he ever be the accidental product of chance evolution? Why would he ever imagine God? How does he have the wherewithal to imagine God? How does he have the wherewithal at all to imagine anything that is not matter? And how can he trust himself? Because that means all he's got is a brain and it's just matter in motion. So what is a thought? What is a thought to a person like this? Watch well, atoms running into one another in the brain. Now, how much trust can you put in that kind of thought process. People will not reduce these absurdities down to the absurdities they are just by a little thinking. Is man the accidental product of a system that really did not have him in mind? And I know that Evolutionists state that in one way or the other. We're the product of chance accidental evolution that has no deliberate purpose at all. Or is man specially created in the image of God, as Moses said in Genesis 1.26? One thing we may be certain, both cannot be true. Both cannot be true. Dr. Thomas H. Huxley, who described himself as Charles Darwin's bulldog because he advocated what Darwin said, defended the doctrine of evolution with these words. And I quote, The doctrine of evolution, therefore, does not even come into contact with theism, considered as a philosophical doctrine. That with which it does collide and with which it is absolutely inconsistent is a conception of creation, which theological speculators have based upon the history narrated in the opening book of Genesis. Huxley even stated that the doctrine of evolution is consistently accepted, makes it impossible to leave the Bible. A fellow by the name of Dr. G.R. Culp in his work, Remember Thy Creator, placed the issue in its proper perspective when he so aptly stated, we stand, I'm quoting, we stand either with God and his teaching of creation or we stand with the evolutionists in opposition to him. The issues are sharply drawn. There can be no compromise. You're either a Christian or an evolutionist. You cannot be both. Of course, unquote, I would say, who's right for sake of our study right now? Well, it's always good to define terms, so we'll do some of that. And no one appreciates trite remarks in a serious study or any kind of evasive tactics amidst a real important discussion, as this one is. So I ask the question, what is evolution? Now, I'm going to be dealing with the general theory of evolution. 
And the best way to describe that comes from a Dr. Kirkut, K-E-R-K-U-T, in his The Implications of Evolution. Now, this was published quite some time ago, 60 years ago. In this, he talked about the general theory of evolution from what he termed the special theory of evolution. Special theory of evolution refers to the occurrences of limited change, variation within limits or kinds. You have cows. You can genetically change them. So they even have pygmy cattle now. But they're still the same kind. Bovine cattle. No one's arguing against that. There's a whole host of things that change within a kind. Most of the canines running around here today didn't exist 500 years ago. They've been bred into existence. One of the things that was interesting here about 30 years ago, thereabouts, was that the old, uh, I forget how they would term it, but the old basic animals in which we've got most of these improved animals today, we had been dealing so much with the improved animals, the old animals which they started with were about to disappear. Have you ever seen in the pasture these black cows with white bands around them? Well, you see them every once in a while. They're some of the old ones in which so many breeds came from. So they urged then a big effort to start raising those again, lest they lose, I guess you'd say, their seed crop <laughs> to be able to go on. And you can do that with a number of things. It's true of swine, from which came various kinds. When I studied agriculture and we studied swine nearly 60 years ago, I still got my old agriculture notebook they made, made us keep. And we had the basic uh, names there. Well, I've come across in recent years, I say recent, 20, 30 years, last 20, 30 years, all sorts of names of swine I never heard of. They weren't in that. You couldn't find them. They've developed them. In fact, it uh, used to be that everybody wanted the hog that really was a fat, lardy hog. But long about the 1960s, they decided they didn't want that fat lardy hog anymore. So they developed such a breed as a land race, which was a lean hog. Well, that kind of evolution, the fundamental meaning being change, within a species, within a kind, has always taken place. People wonder, well, how in the, what side, how did they get all the animals on the ark? Ever dawned on anybody there weren't as many animals then as there is now? That whatever was on that ark produced everything that exists today, just like we came from Noah and Shem, Ham, and Japheth. All those animals walking around on earth today came from the animals that came off the ark. But they've changed genetically, but Hog still a hog. Horse still horse. Different kinds of horses. You ever notice how many kind of horses there are? But they're all horses. So we're not opposed to that. This is variation within limits, within within kinds. So we don't desire, we don't deny the special theory of evolution as it was called. You see Shetland ponies. And you see Clydesdales. <laughs> They're still horses. You see a Chihuahua dog, and then you see a St. Bernard. They're still dogs. But that's a special limitation within a kind. The general theory of evolution is, to coin an old common phrase, what I read to you in the beginning, amoeba to man. Amoeba to to man evolution. And perhaps a good definition of the general theory of evolution, which we're trying to introduce to you and we'll discuss, is this. 
All living matter as we know it today had its origin from one primitive source. From this spontaneously produced source, probably originating in the primeval ocean water from a combination of existing molecules and atoms, life began. And through ends of time, changes in this life form took place in a progressive manner. From unicellular life came the more complicated invertebrate life. From this vertebrate life, finally primitive man made his appearance and evolved into the human species of today. People who believe this kind of thing are the ones who say, well, you know, man could evolve and we're just a higher form of animal and we may be gone off of this earth and something else replaces us. Well, if I believe such stuff as this, I don't know why that wouldn't concern me too. And with some people, I, the quicker they go, the better off it'll be. But, but the point is, is that that's not the way it works. There's nothing scientific about what I just read to you. There is no proof for the fact. Back in 1967, there was a furor in Arkansas. I was a junior. I think I'd, I'd transferred to state school up to Harding. There's a big furor in the state over the right to teach evolution in the schools. Uh, you got to realize how long ago that was. But I wrote a letter to the state paper they actually gave it a headline, a copy of which I still have. And they called it United Front of Evolutionists. I quoted a number of these fellows. I pointed out in there, no one is opposed in being learned about things to know the theory, underscore theory, of evolution. It's out there. If I'm going to study any view of anything, I need to know people believe it. I study a lot of religions that are false, but I do it because people believe it. But I said that's not the problem. The problem is, is those who want to teach it in school want to teach it as a scientific fact, and it's not. And I quote it from different ones, scientists themselves who said it's not. Now, if you listen to some of the folks today, you'll think that it is because that's the way they're represented. But those who have met people in debate who knew what they were doing have never been able to prove that the theory of evolution is a fact, that it's even scientific. They just haven't been able to do it. Well, you may be saying, why, why then do people believe in evolution? That's not a bad question. We're talking about how evolution upsets the Christian home. It does it usually through uh, public schools or somewhere or another like that. I'm convinced at least three main reasons exist as to why people believe evolution and one of the early though not a member of the church fighters against evolution was Dr. Henry M. Morris director of Institute of Creation Research in his book The Twilight of Evolution I think that book's still available I don't know and here's what he stated in his book and I quote the main reason most educated people believe in evolution simply because they've been told that most educated people believe in evolution. <laughs> and that's exactly right. They parrot it. I found that out in graduate work. Professors stand there with a Ph.D. behind his name, and he's making these statements. Well, I sit there and say, well, how can he make those statements? I remember one time sitting in a statistics class at Oklahoma State University, and this fellow is saying now, 
Education is not designed to change people. Well, the class was composed of superintendents working on their doctorate and other teachers and junior college people, all working toward a doctorate. And you don't have to be a 13-year-old to sit there and glazed over eyes. You can be a 35-year-old with a master's degree trying to earn a doctorate and still have your eyes glazed over and never really catch what's said. It doesn't make much difference. It's sort of like preaching. You get used to the glazed over eyes. <laughs> but I thought, I'm not going to let this pass. I raised my hand. I said, you said that education is not designed to change people? Yes, sir. I said, wasn't that statement you just uttered designed to change people? There was a lady sitting over in the back. I suppose she was, she was older than I was. In those days, that would put her 40-ish, I guess. And she goes, <laughs> that's sort of like saying, never say never. <laughs> and I knew it made my point. And he immediately said, well, let's move on to something else. And that's usually the way it's dealt with. I had that happen two or three times with different things. And I found out those fellas, though they had a string of degrees behind them, that doesn't prove they have anything. Listen, here's what it proves. They have a string of degrees behind them. Now, maybe in their, and no doubt in their field, the details of their field they know rather well. But the implications of what they know, they have never considered. And that's where I found out I could catch them most of the time. Many years ago, uh, Dr. J.D. Bales and R.T. Clark wrote a little book on why scientists accept evolution, which I have. It's one of the more interesting little books on why they accept evolution. Here's what they said, quote, evolution is taken for granted today and thus it's uncritically accepted by scientists as well as laymen. It is accepted by them today because it was already accepted by others who went before them and under whose direction they obtained their education. Well, Dr. Bales and Brother Dr. Clark even went on to state firmly that, quote, the pressure to accept evolution is so strong that there are many who accept it because they're afraid of what others may think, unquote. It's exactly right. To this, it's worse now than when these things were written. I'll give one more and we'll have to stop. The second reason why people believe in evolution seems to be best stated by a fellow by the name of, uh, and the title, Sir Arthur Keith, who's a member, was of Britain's Royal College of Surgeons, the former president of the Royal Anthropological Institute, when he said, and I quote, evolution is unproved and unprovable. We believe it because the only alternative is special creation, and that is unthinkable, unquote. And that sums it up, too. I'd say at least a man like this is being honest. I can't afford to think God created me because that puts me under his power and accountable to him as my creator. And they're not going to do that. Remember last week I said something about why don't, why don't some people believe these things? And I answered that by saying, I don't want to. That's exactly why people don't believe a lot of things. Professor D.M.S. Watson, who, hold, who held the chair of evolution at the University of London, so well stated, quote, evolution itself is accepted by zoologists, not because it has been observed to occur or can be proved by logically coherent evidence to be true, but because the only alternative special creation is incredible. Dr. L.T. Moore of the University of Cincinnati some time ago stated the matter like this in his book, The Dogma of Evolution, and I quote, our faith in the idea of evolution depends upon our reluctances to accept the antagonistic doctrine of special creation. What they're saying actually is that we know if we accept the Genesis account of creation, 
we know the implications of that in our own conduct. What they're actually saying is we don't want to accept the implications of that, so we must deny that there's a special creation. And that way we don't have to accept the implications of it. But listen to Theodore um, Schwartz in his book, Theodore Schwartz, called Evolution. And he stated the matter, I think, most clearly when he said simply, quote, evolution is accepted by scholars and scientists because it categorically denies the word of God which they hate, unquote. There it is. Now let me ask you something. And we could, and we will probably in the course of this little study. Why don't you think these folks will debate these things more and more and more? Because they've got to face this. They've got to face these things. People, to state what he said in other words, because of this second line of thinking, are really saying, in essence, don't bother me with the facts my mind's made up. But no scientist wants to be thought of in that way. I think Mark Twain stated this issue best when he said, it is strange that what some people believe so long as it's not in the Bible. Unquote. I'll pause here and say that we'll mention the third reason people believe in evolution. Next Sunday, the Lord willing, time goes on. Now, what I'm giving you is not in this book. But this book has introduction which covers some things. The first chapter is one from me on a brief history of evolution. And I simply start by saying it's not a matter of science and it's not true. In fact, it's one of the most fanciful stories you ever saw. John will remember when we were out at Kew Gardens and they have a depiction of what they consider to be as this primordial soup. When you walk in the door, it looks like where a bunch of ducks have been paying in a pond and how muddy they can make it. And they were letting that illustrate the primordial soup from which came the first inklings of life. Now let me ask you something. Is that not as great a fictitious, phantasmagoric thing to try to figure out looking at a mud hole that things got busy in and of itself accidentally, and you still got to explain where the mud hole came from, uh, and got busy, and over billions and billions of years, accidentally, no purpose to it at all, life, some way or another, came out, and that life then began as evolutionists to develop as I read it uh, at the beginning of this sermon. Or to believe that in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, which makes more sense. Which is a more reasonable response? And that's the way you deal with these people. Which is more reasonable? Because they can't deny they don't have the powers of reason. So you appeal to that. Which is more reasonable? To say that you came out of a muddied up prehistoric duck pond? Or that you are designed purposely and specially in the image of God? And that's why you can think like you think. And that's why when you're allowed to think simply and to the point and you see a turtle on a fence post, you know it didn't get there by itself. As I said, we'll close here. If you want these little books, let me know. If you're not a child of God, we beg of you to believe that Christ is a son of God. Repent of your sins. Confess your faith in him. And be baptized for the remission of your sins. That's the only way anybody can become a Christian. How do I know it? Because the Bible tells me that. I don't just pick one part of it and say, well, that's all you have to do. I try to take all the totality of what the Bible teaches and what one must do to be saved from sin, what one must do to become a Christian. And as a child of God, if you sin, then you need to have a tender heart. One that can be easily pricked by the word of God. And that if you see sin in your life, you'll repent of it, confess it, and pray God for forgiveness.
So if you have need of these things, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.